Welcome, my friends, to a very special uh, edition of Blue Review. Uh, I'm still in the Extreme and Forgotten series, and uh, I'm going to look at today uh, one of the most extreme and most forgotten, at least in very recent years, but for many years prior to the 2000s, it, w it was forgotten, seemingly. Uh, really, one of the most unique films ever made. That you love it or hate it, there's absolutely nothing like it. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to get into. Uh, I've taken a few notes. Notes, believe it or not. Can you believe it? I mean, some of this is going to be off the cuff, but I want to get some of this shit right, man. Because I, I love this movie. For a number of years, it was my number one favorite movie. People would ask me, what is your favorite movie? And I would tell them, and they're like, what the fuck is that? So if there's any here don't know what it is, you're going to find out. If, if you do, hopefully you will dig this. Uh, here he goes. Sweet movie, 1974, directed and written by Dusan Makaveev. Uh, previously known especially for the great uh, WR Mysteries of the Organism. Uh, which is part documentary, part fictional story where he uh, discusses the life and uh, beliefs uh, and work of Wilhelm Reich in the documentary side. In the fictional side, he uses a modern Yugoslavian rendering of a group of sex-positive uh, ideal communists uh, led by a revolutionary woman named Milena, uh, which kind of uh, puts Reich's theories into practice. Look at that beautiful cat. That's a great shot. Look at him. It's the first time you guys have seen his whole body. He is a majestic. <laughs> He's yawning. He's a majestic creature. He's going to help me co-host this. I hope. So, sweet movie was a French dash Canadian dash West German co-production. There were all kinds of. I'm going to turn my phone off. There are all kinds of mix-ups along the way uh, with the various um, countries that were contributing to the fundage of this. Uh, you know, some people thought Makabeyev's script was, you know, out of control, you know, which it was. Uh, but he managed to get a lot of Canadian talent on board and French talent. Uh, he finally had to finish the film in France, um, and uh, he was able to get... Uh, you know, great footage like the Eiffel Tower in France, and then in Canada, he was able to get uh, aerial footage of Niagara Falls, and um, uh, all of which are woven marvelously into this film uh, in ways which, you know, you'll find out in conventional ways. Uh, so, this film premiered, its world premiere was June 12, 1974, in France, uh, and then uh, March 21st, 1975, in Canada. Uh, in May 1975, it premiered at Cannes, and uh, it was kind of, yeah, it was a success du scandal. I'm not saying it right. A success of scandal, a scandalous success, and I'm going to go into that more later. Um, didn't win a prize. It should have won a special prize for outrage. I think there is such a prize, the, uh, the Audacity Prize. Yeah, I think that exists now, and some interesting films have won it. Uh, anyway, October 3rd, 1975, this finally premiered in its, uh, last, uh, country that helped fund it, West Germany, and then on from there. I do not know when it played in the United States. I'm pretty certain it did play in the United States. I do not believe it played, uh, in North Carolina. But it would have been cool. It would have been cool. Um... So yeah, uh, it's a 98 minute long color film. The budget was the equivalent of $700,000 today. And uh, there's also an Italian language version. I'm not sure when the Italian uh, version uh, premiered. I didn't get that date. Uh, the Italian language version was, uh, the script was translated and a little modified um, by Pierpolo Pasolini, you know, the infamous you know, Man Behind Salo, Tiarima, Corchile, and so much more. 
Uh, I think I've reviewed a couple of his items on here. Say hello. I think. I know I've reviewed Tiarima. He's one of my top 10 favorite filmmakers. And so is Mr. Makaveya. They were a marriage made in just somewhere mad. And uh, Pasolini loved the material. I don't know that he and there's not much to indicate that he and Makaveya have corresponded directly. Uh, they definitely didn't meet in person. But Pasolini uh, loved it, and his his uh, he was given the um, a big credit as it's um, you know it's kind of like you get a more uh, a, say you have a, a film shot in a foreign language uh, and it comes over to America uh, and you'll see on there and it's been massively dubbed and this is the older days. You'd see this, and you see English language version directed by. And so that person directed all the voice talents and made sure that it was going to flow the way they wanted it to flow for their market. And that's what Pasolini did. And what what I just found out yesterday that was remarkable, he even rewrote one of the songs on the soundtrack with uh, new lyrics, which had a slightly different, though sympathetic, meaning. Now, of course, Pasolini was a Marxist, so his ideas to a large extent, were sympathetic. His politics and Magaveyev ha had some, uh, they dovetailed in a lot of ways. So this film was produced by Richard Hellman and Vincent Mai, who is Louis Mai's brother. I reviewed Louis Mai's Black Moon on this channel a while back. Cinematography is by Pierre Long. Uh, editing is by Jan David. And the music is by Manos uh, Hajidakis. It is an incredible soundtrack. Um really some beautiful memorable themes uh happy sad uh, you know melancholy uh you won't forget the themes and, and um it does a lot to enhance i can't imagine a different score um so let's get into the cast finally of the uh, technical stuff uh carol lore stars uh she went on to do uh, a famous uh role in a french film get out your handkerchiefs uh, in recent years, uh, the extreme filmmaker Karim Hussein directed her in, I believe it was called The Beautiful Beast, uh, and I'm sure that was total stunt casting for him being a fan of Sweet Movie, and she looked like she'd barely aged, and her character is very dark in that movie. John Vernon, uh, John Vernon, you know, is Canadian, but Gary Lohr is French. John Vernon is Canadian, and that's how they hooked up with him. Uh, he had been... In the 60s, he did voices for Marvel superheroes cartoons. Uh, he notably did the characters of Glenn Talbot in the Hulk uh, series. He did the voice of Tony Stark slash Iron Man. He did the voice of Prince Namor the Submariner, and he did some other background and villain voices. Uh, and then he moved on to the following year in Point Blank by John Borman, which kind of, you know, was his acting kind of breakthrough. So six years on, seven years on from that, here he is in this insane role, which didn't ruin his career, amazingly. Uh, it also features Jane Mallet, Roy Callender, I'll get to them, uh, Marcus Sedan, I believe from Black Orpheus, Orpheus uh, Sammy Frey from Godard's A Band of Outsiders, um, Roland Topor, who plays a member of a commune, run by Otto Mule. They're basically the Milky Way commune. They're basically kind of playing themselves. The Milky Way commune was one of several uh, iterations of Otto Mule's uh, communal style of living where he would perform these uh, outrageous, grotesque, uh, cathartic, uh, symbolic uh, performance art pieces, uh, very physically extreme pieces, uninhibited, uh, and you know, we'll get into that too. Material action and was uh, his, or actionism, that was his um, forte. That, that was kind of the label for, the general label for performance artists in that vein, mining uh, that particular kind of sensibility. And finally, Leon, Leonid the Rat. It's this really cute rat who hangs out with Pierre Clemente. Oh, I missed two cast members. Anna Prokonol. Okay, Anna Prokhanov plays two, two characters, a lead character in one story and one of Otto Mule's commune. She sings in both. Oh, and Pierre Clemente. So, yeah, he's been in, like, The Designated Victim, Belle de Jour, Corchile, 
uh, the cannibals, you know, anything that's where he's, you know, you need a sullen, strange guy, Clemente's there for you. What else was he in? Uh, Steppenwolf. We could go on and on. That guy, he's had quite a career. I'm sorry I skipped him. But Leonie the Rat was an actual rat that was hanging out with Pierre Clemente's character. And he kept him under his hat and he played with him. I mean, this wouldn't really matter except Leonid the Rat is actually dubbed, uh, dubbed, is actually, um, Credited in the beginning credits, I believe, before John Vernon. So I don't know. And that wasn't an alphabetical thing, was it? Well, I guess L before V, but no, I don't. The others weren't. Okay. So if some of this sounds crazy, it, it is crazy. So uh, there's a whole lot of trivia attached to this film, and there's a whole lot to say about it. Um, and also my own experiences with the film. That's a big part of this. And I've got a nice little stack of things here that I'm going to share with you in a bit uh, that detail my own personal experiences with this movie as a fan and as a journalist um, and a, just a generally obsessive, uh, you know, follower of it. So what's the sweet movie? So the sweet movie is um, originally... Uh, Michael Bayham intended to tell the story of uh, Miss World. She won the Miss World 1984. So this is set in 1984, by the way. Uh, and um, so I guess it's a, a future movie. Science fiction. It has some time travel in it, too. We'll get to that. Um, so Miss World uh, won this contest uh, sponsored by the Aristophanes Aplanap Foundation. <laughs> and Aplanap was a, uh, a Texas billionaire um, played by John Vernon. And basically he wanted uh, a virgin, the most perfect virgin, the most perfectly formed hymen, most perfectly innocent. And so they do this crazy thing called the Crazy Daisy Show, uh, Window into Reality, a breath of cold air from another world. That's part of their tagline. Um, and their host says, you know, we're, it's an honor to host this thing on live TV. Uh, presumably in Canada, they are um, trotting out women from all over the world to have their hymen inspe hymens inspected by this, you know, this goofy slapstick doctor. Um, and... Uh, yeah, uh, the, the Aristophanes' mother, played by Jane Mallet, she is like this incredibly old woman, and she's hilarious. She's very Phyllis Diller-esque, and she's uh, she's really kind of uptight. She's an embodiment of Reichians, of the Reichian ideas of the body armor. When you uh, your own body creates the armor, uh, like. They call it the Chastity Belt Foundation. That that's one of their companies, the Aplin Alps. And they're like, you know, she demonstrates it on camera, and she's like, you know, no, no, no tight binding corsets, no, no, no hard metal shells. We make this uh, row of muscles contract and keep in the the unnatural urges and the unholy, you know, the un unwholesome uh, stirrings. And so yeah, it's pretty fucked up, you know, it's teaching sexual repression. So a whole idea, one of the whole ideas of WR was that communism, the way they were portraying it was sexual liberation. And actually um, the sexual revolution itself was a term. That phrase was coined by Wilhelm Reich in the 1930s. And so he believed you could combine com communal living and c communist politics with this sexual revolution. And I guess that's kind of uh, looking ahead to to the free love of the 60s and their communes, there's a direct kind of um, descent there. And by the 70s, you know, uh, WR kind of captured all this, but Sweet Movie takes it to this other level where you've got a whole, these surreal stories, two stories uh, that are intercut that um, are seemingly unrelated up to a point. Uh, but they each express... Uh, these ideas. The Miss World story, obviously with the Chastity Belt Foundation and the world's perfect virgin, you're getting into the sexual repression part. And, you know, what you find out to, to your horror and to Miss World's horror 
because Carol Orr's character is never given a name other than Miss World 1984. And um, she, uh, Senator Stephanie uses her as, uh, how does he put it, like a plumbing system? I don't know how to put it, but, you know, it's like, uh, he's, you know, his, his sexual urges were too messy and all these weird things, you know, chaos in his sex life. And, and he's just speaking all these crazy kind of aphorisms. And on their wedding night, uh, he rubs her down with alcohol, and he's got like a glittering wreath around her, her pubis, uh, like celebrating this beautiful area that he's about to experience. But basically, then he takes out his his cock, and it's uh, gold plated, the head and the shaft, and he urinates on her, and she screams. And then the curtain draws, and you see the mama and these people sh playing violin and shit. And they were there. And he's like, hey, mama, yahoo! And because he had said that earlier. And he's a good Texan boy. So uh, he is quite a character. They're definitely an outrageous turn by John Vernon, I have to say. So things don't go the way Miss World planned, um, I guess. I'm not I'm sure what she planned for. He did not take her virginity, though. Uh, I think he was just going to use her as this elimination system. It's pretty sick, I guess. Like you said, he's a he's a big, um, you know, golden showers aficionado. And um, so, what about the other story? Let's cut in. But quickly, let me say it was going to be one story in which Miss World went through this evolution from this character who is in this sexually repressed environment until she comes into contact with communist revolutionary ideas and becomes a revolutionary a la Milena Dravik in WR and uh, she ascends uh, to the leader of this new uh, sexual liberation communist thing. So that's a kind of cool arc, but Carol Lore quit the movie and so they had to kind of edit around uh, the character's final scenes in the movie, uh, you know, which are played out in this last uh, act, um, and really begin another arc, uh, another story concurrent with and intercut with uh, Miss World. So, hence we have this character, Anna, Pro Anna, Anna Planeta, played by Anna Prochnall, and she's an old-school Marxist. She's, uh, she has this huge... Uh, ship and the prow is a giant sculpted uh, face of Karl Marx uh, and you know it's in the modern day and she's you know she's uh, cruising down the uh, river uh, I'm not sure of what city though I'm not sure she's near the docks uh, I mean I want to say she's in Russia but then I tend to think from later clues that she's like in a, maybe a European maybe France you know city I'm not sure um, but, uh, it's definitely in the modern day though. She is a throwback and she has like a little suitor who follows her around her a bicycle. And this is, uh, this character, uh, what is his name? Pierre Clementi plays him. Um, Valen Chuck, I think is his name. Now he's a character from Sergei Eisenstein's film, uh, The Battleship to Tempkin. Um, so he's kind of time traveled uh, forward into the present, and he's wooing this strong communist woman leader, and they quickly begin an intensely sexual affair, uh, and of course most of their dialogue is uh, uh, in uh, Yugoslavian, maybe, and um, you know they're filled with these revolutionary adages and. Even when they're fucking and, you know, uh, it, it's all kind of like, um, you know, uh, singing these victory songs and hymns and to the, to, uh, to the, um, yeah, my brain went blank. <laughs> Communist manifesto kind of stuff. And, um, so it's pretty wild. So, you know that forms kind of act one is introducing these two interwoven stories. Um, and, 
uh, in Act Two, uh, Miss World is in trouble, um, and she's being kind of manhandled by Arist Aristophanes' uh, decrepit mother uh, and um, a character named Jeremiah, Jeremiah Muscles, played by Roy Callender. He's this, this is large, uh, ripped black man, and he's a trip. And uh, they, she's trying to get away, you know, from this, and she's trying to hide, and, and she still has a virginity, and she feels like it's her only thing, the only thing that belongs to her, you know, these old-fashioned kind of things. And um, so they capture her, and uh, Jeremiah takes her to the top of this giant, uh, it's a milk, it's like a milk factory, and it, it, there's a giant tower um, like a milk bottle, and they're inside of it, and he, he fall, you know, she, they take all her clothes off, and he takes all his clothes off, and he's like, you know, pummeling her, and uh, uh, jousting with her, and, and mocking her, and laughing at her, uh, and finally she seems to, like, sexually gratify him, uh, in a way that she says her father taught her, and after that he knocks her out. <laughs> Then he puts her in a suitcase and ships her off to Paris. Uh, and, you know, he gets to the <laughs> airport, and she's like, it's like very heavy, heavy luggage, sir. And he's like, oh, it's books. It's all books. Philosophy. Lambroso. You know, heavy stuff. And 55 pounds overweight. I'll gladly pay the difference. Uh, and so... Yeah, Mama Yahoo. Um, and uh, I'm watching some of it as I'm talking. Uh, I don't think that was really John Vernon's uh, penis. Uh, they painted in gold but and urinated. I could, I could be wrong. Um, so, yeah, she's on the way to Paris, and that's her kind of long adventure. She ends up meeting a uh, very... Uh, narcissistic um singer called el macho he's kind of a dandy and he's got like sparkly uh, you know eyelashes and big mustache and fluffy black hair and kind of a, a gaucho kind of outfit and big gloves and he's he's singing and you know the miracle of his performances is he's shooting a music video basically at the Eiffel tower and the, and the beauty of it is he you know even when he is just decides to break into song spontaneously later. For some strange reason, you hear the entire group playing, even though they're not there. So it's just, you know, it's surreal and silly. Um, uh, because he immediately had, takes a liking to her, Miss World, and, and her to him. And uh, they have sex at the Eiffel Tower. But I guess due to her, uh, you know, extreme virgin, virg virginal, uh, condition uh, it, it constricts too tightly and he can't get out and so they you know they get to these doctors you hear the ambulance and oh my god and he's like shuddering and you know they talk about how it's like a dog having sex and the female's you know vagina like constricts over the penis until he's you know until he climaxes and so they give they give they give them the shots and Everything's okay, and then they happen to end up, you know, at the restaurant uh, on the bottom floor of the Eiffel Tower, and, you know, his pants are down, and he's, like, covering himself up, and they're like, well, what about a song, El Macho? And he's like, he breaks into the same song he done in the video, and like I said, you still hear the music, and he exits, and she's still, like, you know, totally enamored of him, and starts smashing eggs over her head. And the, you know, yolks are all over her face. <laughs> Eggs were a symbol in WR, too. I guess a symbol of life, um, among other things. So, all right. I'm going to pause this for two seconds, and I'm going to return with more goodies. I'm back. Um, meanwhile, Ana Planeta and the sailor, like I said, get very involved hang out in her uh, ship, fuck in her ship. The hold of her ship is is uh, 
filled with sugar and candy. Um, first tip off to the you know name of the movie, sweet movie. We'll get to the other one in a, in, in a little bit. And uh, in a really shocking scene, they're kind of talking about death, and she's kind of getting a little creepy. But he likes it. He's totally into Balanchuk or whatever. He's totally into her. And she stabs him. And all you can see is into the sugar. And then the blood bubbles up. And he starts laughing. When I saw that scene, which was the first time I saw the movie, it was extremely like, wow, goddamn, because this is really sudden. And then she starts stirring the not blade into the sugar. And the blood comes up, and then you start seeing kind of pieces of entrails. And he's still laughing, and then he just, you know, goes into the death rictus. Um, and then she seduces a bunch of uh, young boys in this uh, lacy outfit that leaves nothing to the imagination uh, uh, as far as her, her breasts or, or lower regions. And uh, it is very strange and creepy, and... Uh, she gives them all this candy. So her character has a definitely a dark turn. She's she's you're not just a revolutionary communist who's forging ahead for Karl Marx and just needs a good sailor to, you know, stick it to her and, and make her feel like a woman. And uh, I'm only saying stick it to her because that's kind of the imagery and the way they're portraying the movie. I'm not trying to be vulgar. Um, but she's actually kind of a psychopath. Um, so we'll get to the cli climax, we'll get to several climaxes, but we'll get to the climax of that, of her tale, <laughs> shortly. As far as Miss World, Miss World, uh, drifts in with this crazy commune, the Milky Way commune, and essentially they're playing themselves. Auto Mule, you know, he was a performance artist, uh, he had a very checkered history. I have somewhere some inc incredible information about him and his life uh, that a guy sent me uh, after I'd been writing some articles on this stuff. I should have I should have dug it out for this, but you know my thing isn't solely on actionism. But I do have some things that I'm going to share. You know my my props, which will give further insight into some of this stuff, and also like my my feelings about it and my history with it. I already told you that. So, um, the commune, uh, indulges in all these kind of, this is kind of a Reichian thing. There's a lot of parallels between, uh, what the commune indulges in, uh, in their performance and what we saw in a lot of the scenes in WR where, um, some of these modern day Reichian therapists are encouraging their patients to go kind of, to, to let out all their trauma, like physically, you know, let out, like feel it down here and feel it going out and screaming. And that's like the primal scream therapy, which, you know, that was another thing of that time and, and stuff. Uh, and it's very similar. And basically they, they scream, they puke, they pee, they potty naked all over themselves. And they, uh, and then they powder them when they've kind of gone through the, Essentially, they're kind of like going backward to their primal beginnings in their mind. It's almost like Scientology where they're tracking the Ingrams uh, in the brain all the way back uh, past all the trauma to where you're clear, as they call it. Um, I'm going to darken this a little and see if it looks any different. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe better. Maybe lighter. Maybe brighter. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and, uh, yeah, and so, you know, they all are, like, they're fucking and they're chanting and they're screaming and they're taking, you know, <laughs> they're taking, uh, they're excreting into bowls and walking around with it and smearing it on themselves and uh, dancing and singing. And then these scenes that Anna Prokhanov plays, this, their dual role is one of the communes. Uh, and and, and uh, Roland Topor is in there somewhere. And Marpa Zadon pl plays the character Mama Kamuna, and she's the um, she's the sole black woman that I, a character that I think is in the commune. 
and uh, she, um, you know, she kind of takes care of um, of Miss World. There's two like kind of traumatic, like we we're talking about, like kind of the going back to childhood, almost into the womb kind of therapy. There's two instances of that that are very physical with her and the commune. Uh, one is with Marpesa Dawn, Mama Comuna, where she starts suckling uh, at her nipple. Uh, and then there's another one, which is a you know, similar kind of idea where she just nonchalantly uh, takes out, reaches into Otto Mule's trousers and takes out his very limp, flaccid penis and just caresses it on her face. A very classic shot, the one that you can't always... <laughs> post, you know, many places on the internet, um, at least on social media. Uh, so it's fascinating. So thus begins her, her next and final journey. Um, the journey of uh, Anna Planeta, though, is kind of coming to an end. Uh, the uh, She's gone too far. She's murdered all these children. She's murdered all these young boys after seducing them. And, uh, you know, with the sweets. And the cops have found her. And, you know, they're talking about she's a psychopath. And the news are there. And so everything, it, it, they arrest her. And she's kind of raving. And uh, concurrently, uh, Miss World somehow ends up making a, a commercial for chocolate. And... Basically, they cover her in chocolate syrup, cover her head and toe in chocolate syrup. And I believe that's the, the scene that in which Carol Lohr said, like, enough's enough. That or the commune. Maybe they, maybe they were filmed out of order. Um, but I think the commune, the commune thing literally did traumatize Carol. And, and she really was not thrilled with Machiavelli. And she wouldn't, want, wouldn't be in the movie anymore. So he had to restructure everything. Um and I think the movie's all the stronger. I think the two stories, they're seemingly unrelated, but are thematically related as two ends of one development, one arc uh, of this whole kind of repression to sexual liberation thing. But the thing is, with Anna Prugnall's story, she doesn't turn out to be like a heroic character as she's originally portrayed in the movie. Uh, nor maybe as he intended Miss World to evolve into. I mean, obviously she's she's brought low by her own uh, cruelty. Um, and so Miss uh, World uh, suffocates to death in the chocolate. Well, the cameraman's like, yeah, we got to sell the chocolate. You know, and it's real, uh, you know, it's real lechy. And those, of course, are many famous shots of Carol Orr with the chocolate all over her. And, um, We'll get to some of those. So both, basically, both both of these characters die or die or are undone. In the case of Planeta, uh, both of them are undone by uh, sweets in, in different ways. So hence, sweet movie. Um. So yeah, man, that's that's the gist of it. So see you later. No, just kidding. Um. So I'm gonna look over my notes here. Uh, I'm gonna take another quick. Uh, break here, pause this, and I'm going to be right back with you. If I can pause it. Okay. So let's move into the next phase of my discourse on this masterpiece. I've got some props, some uh, visual aids, which I never had very much. Of. First off, a few years ago, I I found this beauty online, and I had to buy it, and I've worn it proudly many times. A lot of people can't make out what the image is. It is a t-shirt. Can you see that? Can you see it? It says, sweet movie, and that's Carol Orr dra dripping chocolate all over her naked form. What an image. Love it. Okay. Uh, let's go back a bit in time, though. Back to the days when I was writing journalism and reviewing cult movies and sociological kind of articles and stuff. I want to get these in 
the proper order uh, in which they were published. So we're going to do a little bit of flipping here because my memory is about 100,000% about this stuff. Um, there's a funny quote in this magazine. I ain't seen Nashville and I ain't going to. I'd rather see Bambi, Loretta Lynn. Anyway, here's a nice uh, book that I... Uh, I had a nice credit in here on some other really good writers, a nice magazine. A couple of defunct magazines that I worked for that I really, really loved. Worked along, alongside my dear friend, Bill White. Bill White, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, let's, let's get these in order here. Okay, I know those are in order. Okay, I think this was the first. So this is I Magazine. <sighs> The News Culture Submersion, is that what it says? Yeah, so number 14. Uh, this was a, a, a nationally distributed magazine. I bought it at my own Barnes & Noble. So I also had contributor copies. That's where I first saw it, at Barnes & Noble. And I, I thought it was a cool magazine, and I saw it was based in Rome. So back then, you know, long-distance long phone calls and all, uh, we don't have this problem anymore. But So Raleigh was a cheap call, and I could say, hey, man, can I send you guys some of my work and see if I can get on with you and it happened pretty quick. The cover says for my article says material action Dionysus gone insane. Uh, the table of contents says fringe culture material action part Charles Manson part G.G. Allen weirder than either one. Hmm. And here's my article which at the time was illustrated by, um, you see that? Illustrated by uh, stills and, and screenshots uh, from my videos that I've gotten from Video Search of Miami, uh, which then were the only bootlegs you could really get uh, of images from the uh, actionism uh, performances. So these were the same people that were in Sweet Movie doing their performances. Um, so... So I started the article with some quotes here. Uh, now, my editor would sometimes throw things over this because he has a giant thing here about Gigi Allen. And, and I mean, you know, I understand, you know. Um, hold on. I have an old pop-up situation. Uh, he wrote, Sam wrote, if you think Gigi Allen went over the edge, think again. A group of Viennese artists annihilated the boundaries in the 60s and 70s and their influence is felt to this day. Okay, hold on one second. And speaking of extremities, I just wanted to mention, I neglected to mention that throughout the sweet movie, there are there is footage of Holocaust survivors and people who died on the Russian front, and it's ghastly. Um, you know, all through the wars. Uh it's really sick. It's much, mostly to do with the Russians and Nazis uh, fighting, and it's pretty nasty. And I want to say at the end of Sweet Movie, a very important point, the children are wrapped up, their dead bodies along the shore, uh, the ki kids killed by Anna Planeta, who fed them uh, sweets and then murdered them. And you've been seeing this growing um, accretion of imagery uh, from these kind of, you know, these horrible uh, conditions, these, these Holocaust images. And uh, the kids, like, wake up one by one uh, and stir. Uh, you know, they don't look like zombies. It's just like they're waking up. The kids are just coming out of their little little sleeping bags. And, and that's kind of the end. And that's pretty pretty heavy. There's a lot of heavy, subtle shit in here. Or maybe not so subtle, but very interesting juxtapositions of things. A lot of uh, little beats that are quotes and um, uh, images for throughout history. Uh, of things relevant to this uh, subject matter of Sweet Movie. So it lends it extra texture, extra layers. In my article, I just wanted to fa uh, 
focus in on what I wrote about about the sweet movie. Um, you know, this is the entire history of these people. Um, and I kind of described the extant videos that were around at that time. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and I don't know how this reads now. <laughs> it probably sounds like crap. But I'm going to give it a shot here. I'm going to give it a shot. Artist therapy. That's a subheading. We now arrive at Mule's final cinematic outing, one which exposed him to his widest international audience. Mule's fascination with primal artist therapy, drawing on the tenets of Reich, culminated in his appearance in Sweet Movie. Directed by Yugoslavian auteur Dusan Makaveev. Makaveev was at that time perhaps best known for his brain blasting ode to Reich, W.R. Mysteries of the Organism, 1970. In the midst of what was already one of the most indescribable pictures ever made, Carol Lore, who plays central character in Miss World 1984, once been the care of a radical therapy commune, La Voix Lacte, the Milky Way, portrayed by none other than Otto and his real life commune. Uh, even after her many insane adventures in the film, what she witnesses at the commune is enough to hurl Miss World into a complete fugue state. Um, and then we kind of describe uh, how they, you know, attempt to feed and nurse her and have a foot fi uh, food fight and spew edibles all over each other. I'm just kind of skimming through this. Uh, yes. Um, one of the commune, perhaps Mew Otto himself, and yet yeah, confirmed it is Otto himself, uh, pull pulls a huge phallic sack of meat from his trousers and proceeds to hack away at it with a meat cleaver yelping in mock agony at each whack and tossing a few choice morsels to the wretching troop to devour, Laura flings it aside and pulls the man's real penis forth to cradle it beside her tear-stained sheet. And then, basically, I go into extreme detail. Kind of the stuff I said yesterday about their various bodily functions and, and, and all this kind of psychosexual uh, stuff that's going on. And Mule's work here is much less disturbing, although still nauseating. Using his methods to break through his patients' learned body armor so they can play innocently with food excretions and their genitalia. Carol Lore, however, like her character, is deeply traumatized by her encounter with Mule. He's a, he's a traumatizing character. Uh, and even dropped out of Sweet Mood for fear it would damage her career. This forced Magabeev to shoot a parallel storyline and intercut it with lores. Okay. So that was my first dabbling in, in talking about Sweet Movie and, 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 and my deep love for it. So I'm going to give even more Sweet Movie justice. I'm going to give even more Sweet Movie uh, specific here in a minute. And the cat's still up there. I don't know how this lighting is. Is backlighting? It's okay, I guess. Anyway, I hope you guys don't mind. It's kind of misty. Feeling. Um, so let's look at video eyeball. This is the Oscar antidote issue. Uh, this is when we're all encouraged to write uh, pieces about movies that didn't get nominated for Oscars and should have in our minds. Movies that were a little uh, too offbeat for that. And so each of us picked a movie for a particular year. We went through the different years. I don't think we went through every single year, but we didn't have any like repeat in the years. Um, there's some interesting selections some people made. Uh, Murder My Sweet and Bad Day at Black Rock. Bill White wrote that. Seance on a Wet Afternoon. Dead Ringers by Paul Gaeta. So how about Sweet Movie, Eyeball Oscar Alternative Foreign Pick by Henry Covert. So, the best foreign film Oscar that year uh, that came out for the 1975 Oscars was Amarcord. Uh, okay. Uh, in this one, I basically just go over the whole basic plot uh, once again. Uh... And, you know, I won't go into there again. But I will go into this little part. What to expect. Yugoslavian director 
uh, Yugoslavian-born director, Yusan Makaveyev's sweet movie was the success, the scandal at the 1974 Cannes Film Festival, much like Cronenberg's crash later in 1996. It provoked much outrage there, and it, at its U.S. premiere in New York in October 1975, it was met with even more vociferous attacks. Even after four minutes were cut, it was declared a social disease by Time magazine. Vincent Canby called it elitist, grudgingly admitting it was a courageous work, but way over his head. The auto mule sequence and honest and a seduction, seduction, seduction of the young boys were two scenes that proved troublesome for viewers and critics. Okay, and me. Um, Makaveyev had directed W.R., uh, blah, blah, blah. Sweet movie is almost W.R. through a mirror darkly. Taking Makaveyev's communist, capital, communist capitalist dialectic to its terminus, using Reichian motifs to illustrate his concerns. If Anaplaneta is a twisted take on W.R.'s ideal communism, ideal communist, Milena, uh, then Miss World embodies the excesses of late capitalism. Now, I do believe that. And, and almost, I almost want to say some of this is kind of prophetic. Uh, with things that are happening now. Machiavelli cloaks his deeper meanings and transgressive intent and surrealistic parody. Sweet Movie is a tour de force of lunacy, buoyed by strong vision, top-notch production values. It maintains its those outrageous facade from start to finish, delivering for me a true quote-unquote feel-good movie. Although, albeit for those whose definition of the term uh, is more like Roseland than Jerry Maguire, while well, it provokes and entertains on several levels. And I meant at Frederick Hobbs' Roseland. Um, and they made me do a scene focus, you know, and then a soundtrack. Uh, yeah, we talked about some of this. Notebook. Mm. In that book, I talk about uh, the whole mule thing and the trauma traumatic stuff, the cast, uh, and of course the editor threw in that we had to remember that John Vernon went on to fame as Dean Warmer in Animal House because you know <clears throat> we just had to let everybody know. Um, so the next issue, which is the final issue of Video Eyeball, the Evolution of the drive-in movie. Now, I, I reviewed this movie, The Beach Girls and the Monster, so I got the cover story, baby. So in this one, we did... Uh, now, I did do an out-of-competition piece on the Oscar issue about Pierpola Pasolini, but that's not... Where there's a little crossover, it's not really uh, uh, germane enough to, to discuss here. Um, so let's get to the meat of this matter. Um... There's some really wonderful things in here. Uh, he broke it down by the decades and, and found drive-in movies uh, and movies that probably should have been drive-in movies all through. Uh, one guy, Peter Flynn, did a Dust to Dawn marathon on the Planet of the Apes cycle, which made me happy. Uh, when we got to the 60s, um, there were some other nice ones here. Uh, I wrote Django up. I did a nice little Django. Um, I also did Candy. Um, and I think that was my last contrib contribution for the 60s. Uh, some other good ones were in here, though. Some other great movies were picked. Um, wow, a lot of great movies were picked. Um, Destroy All Monsters. Wow. Night Tide. Um, let's see. We're getting there. Bear with me. I swear we're getting there. The Eyeball Beach Party, which was, you know, beach movies in the drive-in. Turn it this way. I'm wearing my braces again, so this is a little unwieldy. So, yeah. The Beach Girls and the Monster. Can you see that? These, 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 these braces are driving me crazy. The Beach Girls and the Monster. I got that from Inglewood Entertainment on VHS and reviewed it. And like I said, got the cover graphic, and I really didn't like that movie. Um, <laughs> so as we hurl on into the, the 70s, uh, we got some other cool stuff in here. Um, 
Let's see. I reviewed Hitman. Um, I reviewed Big Bird Cage. I reviewed Lesh Gordon. I reviewed the Gorgor Girls. I reviewed Watermelon Man. I got some, I got some reviewing, man. Uh, but the main reason I whipped out this issue is not so much to talk all about that, but I, I mean, I just wanted to kind of show you, but it's in the letter page, really, that's the important, important for me. You see, they kind of mangled my copy, uh, when they put up the sweet movie, but then when they did the paste up on it, this editor, Deb Azrael, she kind of fucked it up and, and also mistyped some words, she retyped some words because... She thought I meant something that I didn't, but I very deliberately did. Uh, and so some guy wrote in and, and, and he says um, that the magazine has a high amount of factual errors. So Dave Yunt, the, the editor publisher, he took this uh, opportunity to vindicate me because he felt bad about what we'd done to my, you know, I just skimmed through it when I was reading it to you. So. I didn't, I didn't go through all the, you know, places where they chopped up my text. Dave says, Dear Mr. Kellner, you're right. We goofed up in several places in our Oscar antidote issue. Those you've mentioned are fairly minor when read in the context of the articles in which they appear, but certainly noteworthy. The worst mistake came in an editing mix-up in the overview section of Henry Covert's review of Dusan Makabeev's sweet movie. The wrong edit went to the printer, and the result was a more confusing reading of an already confusing plot. <laughs> Though no fault, of, no, no, no fault of Mr. Covert's, we also misspelled my, Mr. Makabev, Makabev, Mayev's name, and that was my, my fault. I spelled it two different ways throughout, and they corrected it to one, which was the incorrect one. I didn't know how to say it before then, too. I thought it was Ma Makabev, I don't know. I was informed here at this point in my life that it was Makaveev. And it says he forgave us, though, and sent a text that read, quote unquote, the review is so good and passionate and intelligent. It is rare to find a text so well informed. It was a real pleasure. So that made my career as a, a cult movie journalist. That Makaveev read my review and said those really kind, sweet things to me. So. I'm still proud of that. So, yeah, here I am. Uh, I'm getting this out of the way, finally. I've been wanting to work on this for days. Um, and here it is. At almost an hour, I can almost kind of wrap it up, man. Uh, my thoughts, it's one of my favorite movies. It's 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 shocking. It's, it's powerful. It's funny. Uh, it... it, it it's educational, you know, it, it, it's, you know, titillating, it's surreal, it's intense, it, it, it's real, it's very real, and it's extremely surreal. Look who piped up for the dramatic pose back there for my, my little final closing discourse. Thank you, kal I love you. Um... I mentioned time traveling earlier. Yeah, Lou, Lou Bakunin, like I said, was a character from uh, Battleship of Timken, which I believe took place in 1905. But he time travels into the present. But not only that, this is the only time there's actually a crossover between the two stories. An actual one of characters, not just of actors, because like I said, Prupnol is in both stories. Um, is when... Uh, Miss World is expiring under the chocolate, um, and uh, through the window of the studio it's being shot in, Love Bakunin is walking by, Pierre Clementi, and he kind of stares in. A lot of weird moments like that and juxtapositions, and I don't know, man, it's a rich film. The music really just brings it together. It's very celebratory music. It's very... I don't know, man. It's catchy as hell. And that main song, Is there life on the earth? Is there life after birth? And that's sung by Anna Prokhnall. And um, I could watch this movie forever. Seriously, I have. I've got it on now. It's the third time I've watched this yesterday. 
And I want to show you one last thing. A buddy of mine scored this for me on eBay as a gift. It's a little stained. Don't know how many of these stains came from me and for or from who owned it before me. But for twenty dollars, my friend got me this beautiful Locandina, which I used to hang on the wall of my last home. I don't know if I ever will hang it again. I'm not going to sell it though. What does this call? This is a Locandina for a sweet movie. There is Miss World, 1984, in the chocolate. Vincent Mild, you know, presents Dusan Makabe, a sweet movie. Or Dolce Film. And it's got, like, the cast and everything. And it says, uh, I don't know what that word means, but essentially it means adapted in Italian by Pierpolo Pasolini. And Dacia Marini. Dacia Marini. Pierpolo Pasolini and Dacia Marini, whoever that is, uh, adapted this into Italian. Um, and it's got the cast and all that good stuff. But I love Italian Locandinas, and uh, this one is really, I cherish so much. And I'm going to bring all my stuff together here and uh, all my goodies. And I feel like this is now a, a fait accompli, a mission accomplished. Uh, and I feel damn good about that, that I finally I talked to y'all about the sweet movie. Now then, my lighting conditions weren't that great. I look kind of bad in this lighting. I've gained a lot of weight. I'm very self-conscious about it. I've lost a little bit, though. I'm starting to lose. And uh, I may record some more videos later. Uh, I had a couple of days with less pain. But it's crept up on me again today. So I might I might do a little bit of drinking to kind of help just soothe the situation. Um, anything else I have to say, we'll have to wait for another video. I want to thank the following people for helping me so far um, with uh, sharing or donating uh, to my um, crisis situation. All the details of which are below. Please help out if you can. I am in such dire straits. I do not want to lose this house. Um, it is paid for. It is my. It's like Miss, you know, Miss World and her virginity. It's like this is my only property. This is my only property. Um, so who has given Tim and Grace McLean, uh, Lindsay Barlow, uh, Wendy McGin McInnes? Um, they uh, they have all given actual money. Uh, and then it's been shared by Nicola Nazarino um, and uh, Rosemary Tontrabinsko uh, and a couple of other people. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, if you want to give, please give uh, if you can. Uh, if you can't share those links, if you're on social media, if, you, if you're on social media and cannot donate, please share those links on social media. All right, man. Sweet movie forever. Please like, hit that like button, hit it hard. Don't hit it too hard because then you'll unlike it. Just hit it hard once and, you know, share this video. Help me out here, man. I'm really proud of my special here. I'm going to give you all a cool graphic on the thumbnail. Uh, I love you all. And we'll be back to talk about some more extreme and forgotten stuff very soon.